Hi, my name is Jason Carl. I'm a faculty member in Rangeland Ecology at the University of Idaho's College of Natural Resources. We're going to spend some time looking at what makes drones a useful tool for collecting data for natural resource research and management. First though, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I went to school at the University of Idaho back in the 1990s, first in wildlife for my bachelor's and then in environmental science for my master's. My background is heavily in GIS and remote sensing for landscape ecology and natural resource monitoring. I've been using drones for my research since about 2012, first as a scientist for the USDA Agricultural Research Service in southern New Mexico, and then here at the U of I as a faculty member. My goal today is to introduce some basic concepts about drones, we'll talk about how they contribute to scales of observation, explore how we process drone imagery into data products, and then provide some examples of applications in natural resource research and management. Before we get too far into our drone discussion though, I did want to mention that we are offering two drone related courses, one in the fall and one in the spring. Both these classes are cross-listed in REM and over in CALS with the ASM program. And at this point, both are 404 special topics classes, so that's not a typo. The fall course is remote sensing applications of unmanned aerial systems. And in this class, we explore in depth a lot of the stuff that we're gonna be looking at for the rest of this lecture. You'll get some good experience collecting and processing drone imagery into data products. It's a pretty fun class. The second course is a one credit, eight week course offered in the spring called UAS Flight Operations. And the goal of this class is to get you ready to take the FAA Part 107 remote pilot exam so you can be a certified drone pilot and also to gain some experience in flying drones and in mission planning. All right, that's enough of the shameless self-promotion. So let's talk about drones now. All right, first let's look at a little bit of history. What we currently think of as drones today actually had its roots in almost 150 years of development of unmanned aircraft. Now this is a really busy timeline. I don't expect you to necessarily read or even be able to read all the information that's on it. If you're interested, the link for the infographic is on the top of the screen. Not surprisingly, until recently, most of the development of drones was the result of military activities. An interesting thing to note, though, is that the first attempts at unmanned aircraft were way back in the mid-1800s when people were putting cameras on balloons and kites. Now, these were pretty limited for reconnaissance, though, because they had to be tethered and were, they were pretty obvious. So in 1907, Dr. Julius Neubronner strapped cameras to pigeons in Germany and created a lot more discreet way to gain surveillance that actually saw some limited use in World War I and World War II. The person first credited with envisioning an autonomous flying aircraft was Nikola Tesla in 1915. And he pitched the idea to the uh, military leaders in the UK as a defense system. And they made a handful of these aerial target drones, but the project was mothballed because the military leadership at the time just couldn't get their head around it and didn't see the practical value. So from World War II onward, with the development of advanced control systems and, and wireless communications, Remotely piloted or autonomous aircraft have seen increasingly increasing use by militaries. In the 1990s and early 2000s, then, this trickle-down technology from the military drones merged with this growing model aircraft movement and gave rise to the consumer or civilian drone scene that we know now. And around 2010, this consumer drone market just really exploded with the development of cheap, reliable, and easy-to-fly quadcopters. The excitement around the different potential applications of drones for all sorts of business sectors and recreation is now driving the development of the drone technology. In terms of natural resources, though, drone use has a pretty checkered past. My first exposure to the use of drones was not all that positive. Back in the 1990s, check out the tube socks and the Velcro shoes in the photo. I was a student, a uh, graduate student at the University of Idaho. My advisor put together a project with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game to look at using drones for remote detection and survey of wildlife. I and a handful of graduate students had the task of setting up hundreds of turkey decoys in the meadows down at Craig Mountain Wildlife Management Area south of Lewiston. And somehow my advisor had met this guy, we called him UAV Dave, who had a remote controlled plane with a camera on it. 
and he paid to have Dave come out all the way from Florida to fly his plane over these decoys that we had set out. It was pretty dodgy all the way around. Dave, it turned out, didn't really have any aeronautics experience, and he didn't really understand some fundamental principles of flight, like air density, where the air at sea level in Florida is just denser than the air at 5,000 feet on Craig Mountain. So Dave's plane didn't even have enough wing surface or big enough propellers to get it off the ground. They finally got the plane off the ground down at a park in Lewiston, but even then the image quality was so poor that you couldn't really see anything in the photos. And in my mind, this was an abject failure, and it pretty much made me just dismiss the whole idea of drone technology for a long time. Well, flash forward about 25 years, and things have changed dramatically. We now have tons of highly capable commercial drone systems, including inexpensive consumer-grade drones, heavy lift multi-copters, high endurance fixed wing drones, and even hybrid drones that take off like quadcopters and then transition to forward flight like a plane. So the obvious question is what has changed over 25 years to make drones so much more popular and viable now? Most of the technology that makes up drone systems has been around for a long time. Sure, there's been a lot of advances in each of these component areas, but it's really been the synergistic developments, putting all these technologies together, that has changed the playing field. The combination of miniaturized hardware, high-capacity batteries, high-quality GPS inertial measurement units, coupled with wireless communications and mobile devices for flight planning, camera sensor developments, all of this together has made the hardware just much more capable and easier to use. At the same time, developments in computing horsepower and image processing software has made it possible to take the glut of images that we get from a drone flight and quickly turn it into data products. Finally, there have been significant changes in how drones are regulated and how they can operate in airspace with other aircraft, and these, this has really opened up how and when and where we can fly drones. Okay, so before going any further, we need to lay down some groundwork and define some terms. What we commonly refer to as a drone is technically called an Unmanned Aerial System, or UAS. A UAS consists of at least three parts. First of these is the remote aircraft itself, which is not piloted directly by a person in or on it. Sometimes you'll hear this referred to as an Unmanned Aerial Vehicle, or UAV. The second part of a UAS is the ground control station, or the remote control. This can be a dedicated remote control, or a phone or tablet, or some combination. It allows you to fly the aircraft manually or to send it instructions to fly autonomously. The third part is somewhat implied already, but it's the communication link between the aircraft and the ground control station. Now, most of the drones we actually use for research or management data collection have an additional component of some sort of positioning technology like GPS that helps the aircraft or ground station know where it is. This is really important if you're using your drone to make structured observations because without it, your drone can be easily blown away or buffeted by the wind, and having the positioning technology on the drone allows it to navigate to predetermined waypoints and to hold a position against any wind. It's very uncommon for us to do free flight of a drone for research or management data collection. Most often, we use a flight planning app as part of our ground control station. Flight planning apps, like this screenshot from Pix4D Capture, which is the app that we use most often, lets you define the area where you want to fly and set flight parameters like the altitude, what kind of photo overlap you want. The app then draws out the flight path, usually some sort of lawnmower pattern, and determines where each image should be taken along that flight path. Then the flight plan is uploaded to the drone, and at that point the drone can fly autonomously so you still have to have your hands on the controls to take over if there are any problems. The last main piece we need to talk about are payloads. For collecting data, a drone without a payload isn't much use. Payloads are just what they sound like. It's whatever the drone is carrying. Most commonly, we fly drones with either a camera or a sensor like a LiDAR unit as a payload to take photos or record data. Increasingly, though, researchers and managers are using drones to deliver payloads and the center photo is a drone dropping fireballs, uh, which are little ping pong balls that injected with a chemical, they ignite 60 seconds after being dropped from the drone and they use them to start prescribed fires. 
Drones are also being used to deliver biological control insects, for invasive species control, and for planting seeds for restoration activities. For the rest of this lecture, though, we're going to focus on the camera and sensor payloads and how we collect and process the data from those. All right, now that we've laid a foundation of drones and the basic components, we can start talking about how they're used in ecology. For that, though, we first need to talk about scale because, well, because scale is really cool and it gives us the context to uh, most of what we know about how the natural world works. Scale is a product of observing things. To observe something, you need to make some choices about what's the smallest thing you're going to bother with, that would be the grain or the resolution, and what's the largest amount of it that you're going to consider, and that would be the extent. We can define scale in terms of space and over time. And the right scale for looking at an ecological process or management activity is the one that best matches the patterns or frequencies that you're interested in. The trick, though, is getting the data at the right scales. Traditionally, as ecologists or land managers, we've collected data at plot scales in the field because that's what we could do. And it's what we were good at, measuring plants and soil a couple of times a year at the most. Uh, when aerial photography and satellite imagery came along, though, they gave us a whole new set of scales from which we could look at things. However, the scales that remote sensing offered were often baked into the sensors themselves and at fairly coarse resolutions. Drones, though, give us an opportunity to collect data at scales that were not possible before, because flying a drone a couple hundred feet off the air gives us a much higher resolution data than satellite remote sensing, and it lets us look over a much larger area than we could measure in the field. And if we own the drone, we can refly it whenever we want to to get data over time. Finally, when we start stitching together multiple drone images, we can gain even more scales and more data products. Another way to think about drones for data collection is what can they offer us relative to the other types of data that we would collect some other way. I like to break this out into three categories. First is using drones to supplement or replicate things that we would normally measure in the field. This could be done to make more efficient use of our time in the field, but generally these approaches are not as accurate as the field measurements. An example of this is the image on the top left from work that Terry Booth and Sam Cox did where they put a grid of crosshairs onto some high resolution aerial images and then tallied the type of vegetation or soil under each one of those crosshairs to estimate cover and composition within these plot areas. And this is really similar to point intercept based cover measures that we routinely do in the field. A second approach is to use drone measurements to replace things that we would normally measure in the field because we can do a better job with the drone or do it easier with the drone. And an example of this is the top right uh, image where we use the drone to estimate soil loss due to erosion in southern New Mexico. In this case, the drone does just as good a job as measuring soil movement uh, as we like we do in the field, but it's way easier and way faster to do it with a drone, and we can do it over entire landscapes, which is something that's really tough to do in the field. We'll talk more about this example in a little bit. The third approach to using drones uh, to measure things is to measure things that are really hard for us or even impossible for us to measure in the field. An example of this is the figure set on the bottom that shows tracer dye moving through a lake's wetland fringe. Now this would be near impossible to measure from the water surface. And we'll look more into this example here shortly too. So how does this all work? A single image from a drone is interesting and we may be able to get some good information from it but an individual image is really pretty limited. The real power from drone imagery comes from combining multiple images together through a technique known as stereophotogrammetry. Stereophotogrammetry is the construction of three-dimensional models based on the locations of recognizable objects in several different photographs. Essentially, this is saying that if we have two or more photographs of the same object or location that are taken from different perspectives, we can calculate not only the X and the Y locations of the object, but we can also estimate its height. Now you use stereophotogrammetry every time you look at something. Our eyes are set a couple of inches apart in our head to give our brains different perspectives on the things that we look at. 
and our brain uses those images to calculate 3D models of the world around us. Now we've been using stereophotogrammetry to make maps and to take measurements for over a hundred years. The difficulty for drones though is that the traditional photogrammetric techniques for them to work well you need to know pretty precisely where your camera was and how it was oriented for every photo that you take. And most drones that we use, use have consumer grade GPS and use inexpensive inertial measurement units to determine the location and orientation of the drone. And this just doesn't cut it for making high quality maps from drone imagery with the traditional photogrammetric techniques. The revolution in using photogrammetric methods for drone images came through the development of a technique called structure from motion. This technique was originally proposed in the late 1970s, but it wasn't until the 2000s that the computing horsepower caught up enough to do structure from motion on anything more than just trivial images. What structure from motion does that's so special is that it solves for the location and orientation of the camera at the same time that it's estimating the 3D model of the scene. This means that you don't need super precise information on where your drone was when it took the pictures. Snavely and colleagues in a 2008 paper demonstrated the power of the structure from motion technique by using people's vacation photos that they scraped off of the internet to reconstruct 3D models of famous monuments. It's really hard to overstate the importance of structure from motion for turning drone collected photos into real data. Using structure from motion, we can collect images along regular flight lines, and as long as we have enough overlap in the photos, both end to end and side to side overlap, then the software can figure out where the drone was and where the camera was pointed for every photo. This information, called the external orientation, is then used to create or refine the 3D model of the ground surface. Now let's take a look at some of the key steps in the structure for motion process. The first step is identification of key points, sometimes called tie points. A key point is just a unique identifiable point in an image that can also be found in other overlapping images. Think of something like a fence post or a building corner. It's like that, except the software finds thousands of these key points per image. The images on the right and left show the key points the software found, and the image in the center shows lines that link the key points together. One part of this step is creating an initial estimation of how the images relate to each other. So do the images need to be flipped around, moved, or rotated to get them to line up in the right order? Once we have the key points matched and the images aligned, then we can create an initial estimate of the external orientation of the camera for each photo and then estimate the X, Y, and Z coordinates for each of the key points to make an initial 3D surface model. Now this is an iterative process where we use the 3D surface model to improve the external orientation estimates and then we use those improved estimates to in turn make a better 3D surface model. All of this happens in step one of the structure from motion workflow. The result of that step is what we call a sparse point cloud, or a set of three-dimensional points that we can visualize. From the sparse point cloud, we can create a dense point cloud that has tens of thousands of points per square meter, and from that, we can create a gridded digital surface model and an ortho mosaic. An ortho mosaic looks just like a stitched together version of the drone photos, but it's much, much more than that. In an ortho mosaic, the images have been corrected for the distortions caused by topography and the angle of the camera to produce a high quality map data set. Okay, now that we have some background behind us on how drones collect imagery and process it into data products, let's look at some examples of how drones are being used in ecology research and natural resource management. This first example is from where I used to work for the USDA in southern New Mexico. This was part of a study where we were looking into the ecological effects of different types of roads on desert, desert hydrology. Soil erosion caused by water and wind is a big deal in desert ecosystems like this, but erosion itself is pretty challenging to measure in the field. Typically, we would use something like an erosion bridge, which is the picture on the lower left, to get a profile of the ground surface and monitor how it changes over time. 
Rojan bridges are a real pain though because they take time to get set up and leveled right and it just gives you a snapshot of a small piece of ground. So we thought we could probably do just as good of a job at measuring soil movement from the drone. So in 2014 and 2015, we flew a BAT-4 drone, which is in the bottom center, over 72 of these desert road study sites and acquired imagery with a ground resolution of about two to three centimeters per pixel. We ran structure from motion on the images and created 3D models and then compared our 3D models to the ground surface measurements from the erosion bridge. And we found what we were expecting, that we really could nail it when measuring ground surface elevations with the drone. One of the things, though, that this approach allows us to do that we can't do in the field is to look across the whole plot and see places where the soil is being eroded, which are the blue areas in the lower right map, or where soil is being deposited, which are the pink or red regions. This opens up some new possibilities to look at soil erosion from a landscape scale. In this study, we used structure from motion before and after a pinion juniper removal treatment that the BLM did outside of Canyonlands National Park in southern Utah. Using ground surface models from 2009 before the treatment and one year after the treatments, 2010, we were able to show that in addition to removing pinion and juniper, the BLM succeeded in removing a whole lot of soil over an area about 100 acres in size. In some cases, like the photo on the lower right, you can see uh, there were sand dunes starting to form. Uh, the thing to keep in mind here is that deriving this kind of data on soil movement from infield observations would be virtually impossible, but with the drone imagery, it was fairly easy to do. This second example is from a project I worked on in the Cibola National Wildlife Refuge along the lower Colorado River on the Arizona-California border. The Cibola is home to populations of the endangered Yuma Ridgeways rails. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is interested in trying to restore some very dense monocultures of cattail marshes into good rail habitat with openings in structural diversity. In the map on the right, you can see the rail habitat areas outlined in blue and the restora restoration trial areas were outlined in purple. To measure whether the treatments were being successful, we had to first come up with a way to measure the structural diversity of the rail habitat compared to these homogeneous cattail marshes. In 2015, the USGS flew a drone with a LIDAR sensor over the refuge and collected point cloud data on ground surface elevation and vegetation height. From the drone LIDAR data, we were able to clip out plot areas for habitat and restoration areas and calculate vegetation canopy height models. With the canopy height models, we used a spatial statistic technique called variogram analysis to characterize the structural properties of each of these areas. Variograms are based on the first rule of geography that things that are close together are more similar than things that are far apart. And in essence, a variogram is just measuring how similar or close together things are. The variogram curves shown in this slide show how strong the patch development is, which is the proportion of the y-axis that the graph takes up, and how large the patches tend to be, which is the point along the x-axis where the curve starts to flatten out. From these semi-variograms, we can see that the habitat areas have larger patches that vary in height, and this gives us a metric to measure how the uniform restoration areas will change over time. This next example is one of my favorites because it's so cool and yet so very simple. We looked at this one briefly before, but this is an example of using drones to collect data that would be very difficult to collect from the ground or from the water in this case. This example was part of a study by Dr. Frank Wilhelm here at the University of Idaho on how the marshy margins of a lake affect nutrient cycling in a lake in northern Idaho. To understand nutrient cycling, the researchers needed information on water currents and flow around these marsh edges. To do that, they released a tracer die in the water. And then they parked a drone a couple hundred feet in the air and video recorded the die as it spread from its release points. When the drone battery ran low, they flew it back down, changed the batteries, and then put it right back up in the air where it was. And then using still images that they extracted from the video, the researchers were able to digitize and map the spread of the dye over time 
and figure out the flow patterns in this lake. All right, one last example to look at. This is from a project that we did down at the University of Idaho's Rinker Rock Creek Ranch, where we were looking at the impacts of cattle grazing in willow communities along Rock Creek and the wet meadows that surround it. The goal of the drone part of this study was to show that using 3D models from a drone, we could do as good a job or better at estimating willow canopy volume than measurements taken in the field. For this project, we flew a consumer grade DJI drone over the willow stands and created dense point clouds using structure from motion. And then we extracted each willow from the point cloud and measured its width in two directions and its height. And from the height and width measurements, we calculated canopy volume, and then we compared the drone estimated canopy volume to canopy volume estimates that we got from the field using similar measures. What we found was that our drone-based measurements were very strongly correlated with our field measurements. In general, we underestimated canopy volume from the drone, which isn't really surprising because of the dense meadow foxtail grasses that made it difficult to figure out where the ground surface was around the willows from the point clouds. However, this underestimation was predictable so we could correct for it. A final observation about these results is that the drone estimates of canopy volume took only a fraction of the time to generate compared to the time that it took to measure each one of these willows individually in the field. So the drone can get us just as good a data as in the field, but it takes a lot less time to do it. Okay, so that's it for the examples, and this wraps up our quick intro to drones for natural resource research and management. There are many, many more examples of how drones can be used in our field, but this should give you a taste of some of the possibilities. In closing, I'd just like to circle back and mention that if this is something that you're interested in, using drones and learning more about how to use them to collect uh, data, I'd invite you to check out the classes that we're offering and uh, also check out the drone lab and see the kinds of things that we're doing there. Thanks.